Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the Panasonic Business uh, Webinar, looking at the GDPR and NIS implications for the rail industry. Um, just before we get started, I'd like to let you know that we will have time for uh, Q&A at the end of the webinar. If I could ask you to use the question function within the GoToWebinar tool or the chat function to submit your questions um, during the webinar or at the end of the webinar, that would be great. So with that, I'd like to hand you over to Mike Hewitt, our Head of Innovation in the Transport and Public um, Business Unit of, of Panasonic, uh, to take you through the webinar. Mike, over to you. Good morning, everyone. And Rachel, thanks for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for taking some time out today to uh, hopefully gain some insights to GDPR and NIS and really what that means to our industry. Um, as Rachel said, I'm sort of the Head of Innovation and Strategy within the Panasonic Transport and Public UK. I also spend a lot of my time around um, government and industry alliances with RSSB and the Rail Industry Association trying to understand uh, the implication and effects of what's coming our way from a transport perspective. Um, right, I think we're on board now. Um, so topics I want to get through today is obviously give you some bit of background around GDPR and NIS, uh, which is the Network and Information Security Directive. Uh, I'm going to sort of tell you why we need to act, uh, how do we think about responding, give you some insights into what you could do, and a little bit of an overview of sort of onboard uh, infrastructure and the rail infrastructure environment. Um, but it's fair really to say that data, data protection is important, certainly to me. Um, it's probably fairly important to you, and really it's important to everyone, um, because it's, it's our data and ends up in a lot of different places. Now, obviously I've emphasised this isn't a specific piece of legislation to the UK, or even Europe really, I and mean, it has wider implications, it's a global issue. Uh, GDPR has been driven, obviously, out of an EU directive, um, while it's, and its requirements do extend outside, certainly the UK and Europe. Um, I'm not here to talk around some of the big numbers and the fines. Um, we can use that to scare people, um, scare people into buying new boxes or getting consultants engaged. Um, but really, this is about what's, what you need to do that's right for your business. And obviously, the more complex the systems that you have and the data route changes, really, the larger the implications and risks you have to address. Um, and those risks are very important, especially when that data is being gathered by you in the UK and potentially ship to organizations outside of the UK. So we've got to make sure we're aware of where that data is going, how it's being transferred, and what any of those potential risks could be. Um, we're also making more data available. We're sharing data, um, whether that's through APIs or data sandboxes. So we've also got to be aware of those, the sort of implications of sharing that data. Um, so that's a bit of background around GDPR. NIS, which is, as I said, is the Network Information Security Directive. And this is really around the cyber protection of national infrastructure, which pretty much is a global issue, I think. Um, some of the nation states, I think, can have more impact on uh, national infrastructure than independents and individuals, as we've seen recently. Um, and just really a reminder that over, I mean, over recent weeks, I think we've seen a certain amount of activity. So I think it was only two weeks ago where we had the Bitcoin mining infection. Uh, which infected thousands of websites, um, and specifically a number of them were government websites. Um, I think it's fair to say even the Information Commissioner's Office uh, was impacted by the Bitcoin mining infection. Uh, we saw recently with the uh, Winter Olympics, hacking at the uh, opening ceremony, um, the Equifax hack last year, uh, which I think we're still seeing repercussions of. And just an example, even in the UK, we shouldn't forget about it, but in January this year, the car phone warehouse was fined £400,000 for placing data at risk. Um, so this sort of topic is getting a lot of momentum at the moment. I'm trying for the slide to change. Okay, so a little bit of the story so far. Um, I call this a bit of a journey, really relevant to transportation and where we tend to play. But I've got to bring you back to remind you that this is not new legislation. Data protection isn't new. Um, we already have to comply with the Data Protection Act from 1998 and the EU Data Protection Directive from 1995. Um, what we're doing with the new legislation and GDPR is really bringing together 
data processing, data capture and data ownership and data privacy under one piece of legislation and a refresh. I think it's fair to say that since 1998, uh, the world has changed significantly um, as far as how we use data and how we carry data and how we share data. I mean, that legislation was, was really written in a different time. We didn't have smartphones. We didn't have the world of social media, social media. And generally, data was really held within the enterprise and within those barriers of the enterprise. Um, so, yeah, so we're moving forward. So GDPR was published back in 2016. Um, it's a formal regulation for all EU member states. Uh, so what are we going to do with that? Well, we're feeding the GDPR requirements into the UK Data Protection Bill. That's currently going through Parliament at the moment. Uh, and the, the GDPR regulation requires that that's in force by May this year. Um, there are some slight amendments to the GDPR, so we're taking all the GDPR requirements, but within the Data Protection Bill, we obviously build in there certain national security requirements um, and how data can be accessed by uh, certainly EU law enforcement organisations and some of the implications behind that. Uh, I think that bill has now had its first reading in the House of Commons about the 18th of January um, and is moving forward on a fairly regular basis and that will be in place, well actually both will be in place by uh, May this year. So as I said, the Network and Information Security Directive, uh, the second piece of legislation uh, that is again being driven out of EU legislation and that's going to be incorporated by May uh, 2018 this year. So I just also want to point out that um, this isn't just purely around GDPR and NIS compliance. There are a number of other legal requirements and legislative requirements that do impact this as well. Um, and I've got on there the health and safety executive. And you might raise your eyebrows around why is the health and safety executive uh, pointing towards certainly cyber security and data protection. Uh, they actually have some guidance around the industrial control and automation systems and really what um, your role may be as a principal duty holder when you're managing those type of systems. And it's fair to say there's a lot of industrial control systems within the rail and transportation environment. Um, also sat behind everything we do is, is there's guidance from the likes of the DFT around good practices. Uh, they won't tell you what to do, uh, but they'll certainly give you guidance on what the good practice is. And you have to make your decision for your own business on what you should be doing to protect your business. Um, and there's also a lot of support from the likes of the RSSB, the Rail Delivery Group, around what other recommendations you could look um, to implement. Uh, so that sort of updates on, I think, sort of the journey and where we are at the moment. Uh, really, it's, it's where next. So as I sort of alluded to at the, at the start, um, we spend a lot of time understanding what this journey will look like. Uh, and we call it the why, how and what. Um, but just before we drill into each one of those, I sort of want to clarify that really the railway ind industry and transportation is really undergoing sort of unprecedented technology introduction. Uh, a lot of systems are being integrated, a lot of digitization, uh, around work around the digital railway, uh, smarter vehicles, smarter mobility solutions. We have a lot of new rolling stock coming to the UK. Some of that rolling stock was probably designed over 24 months ago. Um, when really NIS and GDPR weren't on the radar as much as they are now. So there are even new rolling stock may have uh, systems that have to be interrogated and understood to understand what the implications are. We've obviously got a lot of greater adoption of intelligent assets. So assets in the network that capture data. Um, capturing data is fine. We need to be able to do things with that data to get a value out of it. And that requires obviously integrating different data streams to understand what could be happening. Um, so there's a lot of drivers that are impacting our industry. Uh, and then underpinning that, the world of trackside connectivity, the better the connectivity is to an asset, the more data we can get off, so the more data we have to manage. Um, really, and all the new technology systems that are going on board that we are involved with. And then there's a whole world of smarter ticketing coming over the next couple of years as well which will have a significant impact on customer data. Again, underpinning all of this, the, real, the, the digital railway program, um, potentially one of the biggest infrastructure upgrade programs in recent times, which has a requirement to really deliver more capacity, uh, better reliability, less disruption, and really a general better journey experience. Um, again, that pulls together a lot of different data streams 
and starts pulling um, data to places where it may not, we may not have normally understood where that implication could be. Um, we also have HS2 coming along, a whole new generation of rail connectivity. So some of those drivers are going to underpin on why do we need to do things, which is what we're going to look at, um, the how, how do we do it, and the what. But really, also, I can't under uh, emphasize this landscape of what continually evolves as a threat evolves, and that landscape changes as well. Um, so the why, why do we do it? We obviously want our passion is to have a, a safer, more reliable journey, a safer experience and to protect the data. To do that, we need to understand what we've got, how do we protect it, how do we detect anomalies, and how do we respond to that. Um, and I'll drill into that in a little bit more later on. And the what, so the different things we can do, everything from encryption to firewalls, password policies, training, educating people, security and operations. So there's a lot of elements we have to pull together. So drilling into the why, and I'll keep coming back to the why, why do we need to do things? Um, and we, call, we do constantly question this. And we know we've got a lot of drivers. So legislation is one of those drivers. Uh, responsibilities. We have a responsibility, as opposed to ourselves, to look after our own data. We have a responsibility to our employees. And we also have a responsibility to the public and the people that we move. Um, and really, it's, it's people are at the centre of what we do. We have a responsibility to make those journeys safer. And we have a responsibility to have more reliable and more resilient infrastructure. And the places that we work are about the people that move through those places. Um, we are generally where people, we're dealing with public. Uh, we don't necessarily have control who can access our network and infrastructure. So we need to be thinking about that. So we need to really relentlessly focus on the people being at the heart of everything we do and making that journey seamless. Okay, so why GDPR and NIS? Uh, why are we drilling on these two things today? Well, the timing is somewhat relevant. Um, given GDPR is will be legislation from May of this year. Um, there's the whole compliance behind GDPR and the Data Protection Act, uh, and really those sort of moral and financial consequences we can't forget about. Um, but really, GDPR is going to be law, regardless of Brexit. So GDPR regulations are fed into the Data Protection Act, which will become law from May this year, and the NAS. Uh, requirements will be law from May this year. Um, so drilling into GDPR, really it's that personal data piece of this has expanded. Um, that data now and the process of that, that data could be, personal data could be anything that reveals their sort of racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, uh, religious or uh, religious beliefs, trade union membership, um, genetic data, biometric data, facial recognition, um, really, it's anything that could be used to uniquely identify a person. Um, and by bringing different data sources together, they can make it quite easy to identify a person. Um, location data that we're capturing from mobile devices, uh, other online identifiers, things like cookies, Wi-Fi logon pages, all of that, all of that feeds into what is now personal data. And we all have a responsibility to protect that personal data. Uh, the heart of GDPR is around privacy by default, not privacy by opting in. Um, so big implications from GDPR and all those, that expansion of what is personal data. Um, and then really the Network Information and Securities Directive is really focused on securing national infrastructure. It's about the framework for protecting national infrastructure of which road, rail, airports is all a part of. Um, and that NIS directive is really around ensuring that member states have really a clear national cybersecurity strategy, which the UK released back in 2016. Um, it's around making sure that as, a, as infrastructure owners, we have the right security incident response teams in place. We have single points of contact and escalations up and really competent authorities both within your business and outside of your business as well. So across the UK landscape, we have uh, the CPNI team, the National Cyber Security Council and the Information Commissioner's Office who all contribute to supporting this. Um, so drilling down a little bit more around GDPR specifically on transportation. Um, and really it's around the public space that we work in. We're dealing with the public, so we are capturing public data. Uh, we're very much a connected world now. All of the personal devices that we have to incorporate in people's journeys 
collecting data from them, how they will be used for future smarter ticketing, uh, CCTV that could be used for smarter ticketing and passenger flow, using CCTV in that public environment to monitor congestion, ensure safety. So a lot of systems have implications around this. But really emphasizing that GDPR is that personal data has expanded to what's being captured and you need to be aware of that. Um, we need to make sure even where data may have been encrypted, um, there are ways that that can still be used to identify uh, potentially individuals. So to emphasize it's around making sure that you have consent to use the data you're capturing from the public um, and you have a real responsibility for that data that you're gonna be sharing with either anyone else or across your business or even outside the business. And then a little bit more around NIS, the, the world of the sort of national infrastructure. And I thought it was just prudent to point out that there is a real difference between the world of IT um, and enterprise infrastructure and what we do to protect our IT systems and the world of really that national infrastructure and the, the operational infrastructure place where we tend to provide most of our support. And really, when we talk operational infrastructure, it's a far more complex environment. We have industrial systems, we have a potential lot of legacy systems that we have to accommodate. So we, we may be connecting old, older types of PLCs, customer information screens into uh, new ethernet networks. We have multiple stakeholders around this space. And generally, I think we have, it's fair to say that we have longer equipment life cycles within the world of critical infrastructure that we have to support. So this isn't like the enterprise world where we had five to eight year technology refresh cycles, um, swapping out servers or core infrastructure or end user devices. Uh, we tend to have more standardized governance around IT because it's less complex systems to deal with. And we do have the whole world of physical restrictions. Uh, from an enterprise perspective, we can tend to secure server rooms because they're within our perimeter. We can secure network access because it's within the four walls of our building. When we're in the public space, we have a, a lot more challenges around that. Um, the next slide is a fairly good example of this. Um, when we look at people traveling through their whole journey, we see, a, we see here the big picture and there's a real mix. Uh, the, the technology we have on platforms, which is everything from ticketing to CCTV to Wi-Fi access, the infrastructure that then those people move through, whether that's the trains, the platform, the customer information screens, um, and then there's the people themselves. It's the devices that everyone's carrying that we potentially capture data from. Um, so really emphasizing that our world is a very complex environment. Um, so we have to balance the complexity of the environment that we work within while looking forward to really enabling that seamless journey experience for the people that use our infrastructure. Um, and that's very important because it's, we don't wanna make this too much of a complex environment to make it difficult to move through. We are moving towards making this whole journey uh, more seamless, um, especially through this whole, the whole public space where we move our people through. So really it's about thinking around getting privacy, be, privacy by default, we call it, at the heart of what we do, um, understanding the assets that we've got, uh, building security and by design at the starting point of whenever you think about what you're going to do next, um, and some of the encryption detection and responses that we need to consider around all of this. So that's where really GDPR and the NIS come together. It's around the data and the infrastructure. So I'm starting to look forward to how do we answer the question? What do we need to learn? Um, well, really to emphasize this, and I think the reason that we're here today, it's trying to show that you, you're not alone out there. Um, there are standards, there are approaches, there are lessons that we can learn. Um, there's a wide collection of stakeholders across transport and national infrastructure. There's support from government, whether it's DFT, DCMS, Office of Road and Rail, um, the Cyber Security uh, Councils. There, don't think about doing this alone. Um, look at how you can engage. Look at the wider engagement and the wider collaboration piece. And that's why we're here to, to be able to offer support and guidance on how do you look to address the issues that you're facing as a business. And also it's important that we look outside of the industry as well. Um, looking across other sectors, whether that's what we're doing in retail, what we're doing in the home around smarter energy, smarter vehicles, what are industry doing and what's industry doing around automation. Um, that said, obviously one of our key challenges when we talk around um, talking around rolling stock, 
is that has to last significantly longer than really the technology that underpins that rolling stock. So technology will go through a shorter refresh cycle than some of that rolling stock that we have to, in the environments that we have to put it into. Um, I want to emphasize that really this isn't about a single system approach. There's no one thing that you can do to all of this. Um, it's around understanding the complex environment and breaking those components down and to assessing the risk and the impact of any challenges. Um, and, and if we look at okay, lessons to be learned, if we go back to last year, looking at the NHS and the WannaCry um, virus infection that they had, that was all driven down to really old Windows PCs uh, that, hadn't, that were no longer supported, hadn't been patched. They hadn't carried out a risk assessment to understand the implications of those devices being infected. Um, so again, just emphasizing that we, we need to look across industry, we need to collaborate, and we need to communicate to help solve the problem. And that's really on to how. Um, now, sometimes we get into a, a really a lot of head scratching on what do we do, how are we going to fix the problem. Uh, the easy one is always to point the finger towards somebody else. It's somebody else's problem. Um, well, it's not. It's, it's your problem for your business, and we have to understand that. Uh, there is a lack of clarity out there. There's no really one standard you can pick up and say, and this is what I have to do. And really, that's because there's no one answer to any of this. You have to look at each system, the complexity of the system, the risk that has to be addressed under that system, and really what, what's the best practice. Um, we can refer back to government statements, and they are generally there as guidance. Um, they are underpinned with legislation, however. Um, so there are legal requirements that we have to address. But I come back to we need to address really as, as an industry challenge. Uh, if we want to unlock transformation across transportation, you know what, sometimes we have to step outside of our normal box of how we're doing things to bring innovation. Uh, when we step outside the box, we need to be looking both inside and outside the box to best practice to fix things. So I'm going to start really again looking at GDPR and compliance. How do we comply? What do we need to do? Well, I suppose really the first one, one of those key ones is awareness. Uh, raising awareness in your business uh, of what GDPR means. And I guess that's why a lot of you are here today. Um, is to understand and increase your awareness and then hopefully you can really take that back into your business uh, up and down and across to what GDPR potentially could mean. Uh, involved there, you have to look at the information you hold and that's the key one. It's around that risk assessment for what data you're processing, understanding the systems uh, and understanding how and where that data could end up. So that's one of the things I'll pull out is first step I was going to do anything uh, you've done the awareness piece, but looking at the information you're holding, uh, you have to look get better at communicating privacy information to your your data suppliers or your customers. Um, and I'll cover a little bit of that towards the end. Uh, again, updating and amending any privacy notices. If you uh, have a captive web portal where you have any Wi-Fi log on, making sure those data notices reflect the requirements of GDPR. Uh, why you why you're collecting information? Why are you going to be processing it? From those data retention periods. Uh, certainly under GDPR, we all have individual rights now. We have a right to be informed uh, through the privacy notices. We have a right to access the data uh, where we think there's an issue with that data. We have a right to rectification or erasure. We, we now have a right to restrict how you're going to use that or you're going to process the data. Uh, there's a, a right to data portability and, and say, no, you can't take and send that data to somewhere else. Uh, we, we have a right to object to you holding that data, uh, for that data to be used in automated decision making. Uh, so that could be anything from what ads you get presented onto your mobile device. Uh, the access to information request. That's another potential big impact on businesses. If you are holding data as a business, how are you going to respond to uh, requests to access information? So as an example of that, if you have a CCTV system and you are storing video footage, if somebody came to your business and said, um, I need or I want to see the footage you're holding from my journey at 10 past eight on February the 14th, as an example. Now, while that might not see, you might seem uh, something that you could do, imagine getting 10 requests for that data for that day or 100 requests for that data for that day. And I think there may be organizations that do get tested over, over the next two years around responding to those requests for information. Uh, you've got to think about the lawful basis for why you're holding data. 
uh, to consent. This is more around now. It's about you have to opt in. I um, mean, we're all used to uh, ticking the box to opt out of marketing emails. Uh, that's changing under GDPR, and you actually have to opt in to get those marketing emails. And really, the Information Commissioner's Office has some really good detailed guidance around that. Uh, some information around children's consent, the implications of storing data for what is currently under 16 year olds, but there is potential that may move to under 13. So if you're capturing data from an under 13 year old, and I think it's fair to say many under 13 year olds now carry mobile devices, we need to be looking at that. Uh, clear, you need to be very clear on how you're gonna deal with data breaches, number nine. Uh, call number 10 out again in bold. Uh, don't generally like using too many abbreviations, but I couldn't get all the wording in. And the, the pr privacy by design, PBD. So at the start of any process, any system, you need to be done designing in data protection, uh, and that needs to be by default. And really the data protection impact assessment. Uh, I can't emphasize when you're looking at your systems now, document everything you're discussing. And I think that's really important because if you ever do have some sort of incident or breach, the Information Commission Office is gonna come back to that design process and that risk assessment process. So really make sure you are documenting everything you discuss. Even if you know what, if it's a post-it note in a meeting, discussion around why you wanna hold some data, make sure that's captured and installed. Um, we'd certainly recommend that all organizations should have a data protection officer, or certainly as a minimum, someone who has responsibility. And the last one is we're, we're sort of more of global organizations now. Uh, there may be certain country specific requirements, but we would certainly recommend that where your organization operates in more than one EU member state, you certainly have one legal authority for your business, not a number of legal authorities. Uh, so that's our view on what you can do to get closer to complying with GDPR, address the one to 12, and you'll certainly be in a good starting position. NIS, the uh, National or the Network and Information Systems Directive again. Um, as I said, it's a legal requirement from, will be from May this year. Uh, when the government published their National Cyber Security Strategy back in 2016, it's a five year program and close to two billion pound investment in improving the security of national infrastructure. And that includes everything from utilities to roads, uh, mainline rail networks, uh, ports, airports, etc. Uh, and it also includes people like digital service providers. So your ISPs, for an example, uh, is classed as national infrastructure now. And really to comply with, with NIS, if you are one of those national infrastructure providers, uh, you absolutely must have capabilities within your organization to make sure you've got the right defenses implemented and maintained. Uh, security monitoring is another key element of that. And the, the directive states that organizations must monitor the status of their networks and systems. So this isn't the case of just implementing systems and leaving them there and hoping they're okay. You need to be monitoring the networks and looking for breaches. Uh, another key element of that will be anomaly detection. So how do you detect anomalous behavior on your network? When something abnormal is happening, you need to be able to identify it and really take the appropriate action and then obviously notification is another key element for NIS. It's the requirement to notify the re relevant authorities of any uh, event, breach, uh, or cybersecurity incident. So talk about how, how do we go about things? What can you do? Um, I, I'm not gonna cover everything that you can do, but I'm gonna look at just a couple of instances, or a couple of certainly a specific, uh, from a Panasonic perspective, obviously we, we understand the world of CCTV analytics, and we have a, really a, a wide breadth of portfolios across our, our product base. Um, we are a technology integrator, and really security and data protection is at the heart of what we do. Uh, that said, we are very much vendor agnostic as a solutions designer and integrator. So this isn't about, we have the best thing. We have to look outside of our products and integrate other products and solutions as well. So here's an example of uh, protecting identity. We said GDPR is about protecting the identity and data by default and by design. Uh, so if I wanna look at a specific application of CCTV. So you know, as we said, the Data Protection Act, we have to protect the individual against his or her right to privacy. So an example here, if we have a camera on our network, we by default encrypt the data 
So that data, if it is stolen, it's of no use. But when we're recording images, we have no masking of individuals. So we can identify individuals, we can identify certainly what their gender is, uh, certainly what their um, ethnic minority could be. Um, so what can we do about that? And there's an example there of using a masking technology. So we use software to mask an individual's identity. So if we implemented a system along these sort of lines, as an organization, that organization has taken the appropriate action to mask and protect individual's identity. So that's a good example of applying technology to solve one of the GDPR potential issues. Um, and again, when we sort of addressing risks from a national infrastructure perspective and sort of countermeasures, uh, if we look at things like vulnerability issues, uh, Panasonic cameras they, they, or CCTV cameras could be hacked into, uh, data feeds could be stolen. So we, we build um, encryption and secure certificates into our cameras by default to stop that happening. Uh, cameras could be spoofed or taken control of independently. So again, we put protection in place to stop that through our security embedded systems. Uh, data could be snooped on or streamed elsewhere. So again, by encrypting that data, we've protected it. Uh, and then things like data alteration. So certainly when we're talking around public national infrastructure, where that CCTV footage could be altered by uh, third parties, nation states, et cetera. We have systems that actually protect and validate that data uh, using one of our semantic partners uh, certificates to detect any alteration. Uh, so we're, we're taking good measures in some of the systems that we do to help you address your GDPR. Uh, and then I just want to really just over or just emphasize again uh, the role of onboard integration. When we talk around the transport place, um, if we look at a train now, a train is a complex place. It's no longer just a minor number of systems. We're integrating many, many, many systems on those trains. And really, uh, Panasonic, we're at the heart of that technology integration and helping our customers to, to navigate their way through GDPR and NIS. Um, but while we're introducing new technology, there are still legacy systems on board that we have to support. Uh, and really, as a summary, um, when we look at the rail and transportation environment, uh, rail operations, mission critical networks and infrastructures at the, at the heart of that, that's becoming more complex by some of the systems we're starting to wrap around that, uh, whether the safety, trespass detection, access control and facial recognition. But we're also further complicating it by enabling our passengers to have their seamless journey. We're connecting them for retail, for customer information, onboard systems. So we are um, our own victim of bringing all these systems together. Uh, so that's where really we're, we're happy. Um, I'd say feel free to reach out to Panasonic. We're happy to come and do some workshops with you to help you navigate you through the issues. And just a, a real world example, um, consider what you're asking for. So this was actually yesterday at Houston Station. I logged onto their Wi-Fi. Uh, they were asking me for my gender, my first and last name, and my date of birth. Uh, they've already got my email address. So really, that personal data, I would ask, really ask, why do they need my gender? And why do they need my date of birth? Um, so really, they should be thinking around uh, what they need to, what data they need to be capturing. So given that we're only a, a couple of months away from a legal requirement to comply with GDPR. There's a lot of organizations out there that really aren't addressing the problem. Um, so I think that's got us through most of it. I'm going to really open up to some questions now. Rachel, are you there? Yes, yeah, sorry, Mike. I am um, mute was stuck on. So yeah. um We've we've had a few questions come in. Um, so one of them was regarding to potential tracks that could be made on a train. Are there any particular types that you've come across that could be made? Uh, well, I think it's part of our risk assessment process. We're starting. We are starting to look at you know what what's what infrastructure is on a train, and obviously there's there's a lot of different systems. Whether it's some of the latest trains, trains that have been refurbished. Uh, I mean, we start with things like we call it the square key attack. Um, where we have a lot of infrastructure on moving rolling stock uh, with less onboard staff, most of that, that infrastructure is actually sat on what we call the square key. So it's a standard key that people can purchase that if they go to a train and open a door up, 
they can access some of that network infrastructure. So they get physical access to switches, to servers, um, could be physical access to engineering ports. They could go and plug a USB device in. So that's one of those things we're thinking about. And okay, what can you do about that? Well, disabling USB ports, disabling spare network ports, anomaly detection. Um, again, things like access to MAC addresses and computer names on board. Uh, if you haven't got a secure Wi-Fi network, some of that data could be visible. Uh, we're starting to think about things like GPS spoofing. Uh, GPS systems are becoming more relevant on board, so we know where trains are, they're geolocated. Uh, I think it was recently in the last three or four months, uh, this was a more of a marine application, but there was a number of large uh, marine vessels where their GPS systems were actually showing those boats that they were in land because someone had sent a fake GPS signal to a vessel. So if you think if somebody wanted to do that to a train, uh, if the train system was using that GPS to geolocate where that train is for some sort of reason, uh, the train would probably think it was somebody somewhere different. And sort of things like uh, the world of denial of service attacks on board, someone gets on board a train, initiates that sort of attack, it could present or prevent some of those systems being activated, whether that's a, a ticketing system, a CCTV system, so those are the sort of things that we're seeing as being potentials um, and things we're starting to think about is, is how do we take appropriate action to protect that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and obviously we've, we've had one come in, so what, what's the expectation over the first year for NIS in the rail industry? Uh, so um, this, is, this has come in from uh, the audience today. Yeah. Okay, I mean, well, the expectation is certainly from May, you must be compliant with GDPR and NIS. And I, I think that the NIS one is a little bit further behind. I think people think around, okay, national infrastructure is electricity grids, but national infrastructure is a mainline rail route. So if you've got systems on board a train, what are you doing about anomaly detection? What are you doing about monitoring that network? You have to ask yourself some really in-depth questions. Um, and I come back to it's it's that identifying the assets that you've got, what data are you capturing, um, where's that data going, so you can make some informed decisions. And you, you have to be documenting that process. So if, if something does happen, uh, from May this year, you're legally responsible for that. Okay. Um, where do you perceive the biggest um, risk to be with managing data? I, I think the biggest risk is one, understanding what data you're capturing and why you're capturing it and making sure you've documented that. And I think the big risk is people not effectively documenting everything they're, being, they're capturing and really understanding where that data is going and what the risk could be of that, the end use of that data, especially where it's potentially being shared with other parties. Uh, we, all, we all understand the potential benefits of big data and sharing data and aggregating data so we can get more benefit out of Okay, looking at passenger numbers against train potential failures or weather conditions. So it's really, it's, it's a complex environment, but I come back to starting with that whole risk assessment piece with what data have I got? What do I use it for and where does it go? And do I really have a, a justifiable requirement for that data? Because in the event of a breach, that's certainly some of the first questions that will be asked. If it ends up being data that was used to personally identify someone, well, why, why were you holding that data? Okay, so so on that um, note, then I've got two questions that are um, closely linked, so I'll, I'll read them out at the same time. So, what is classed as a personal data breach, and how long? What's the timeline for reporting that data breach under GDPR? Okay, so if we talk specifically around GDPR, I mean a data breach could be accessed by an unauthorized third party to that to that data. So as an example, if that data was the data stored on a train, um, as an example, CCTV data stored on an onboard video um, recorder, and somebody decided to access that images. Um, so that's, that's one example. Um, really, uh, another one is, is deliberate or accidental action or inaction by a data controller or processor. So you send your data to someone to do something with and they do the wrong thing with it. Um, so even, even though there may be an, an authorised processor, they've done something inappropriate with that data. That's again, class of data breach. Um, sending data to incorrect recipients. Um, I think there was a case in the last 
now I've said in the last four weeks where a marketing organization sent some uh, customer information to the wrong organization. Um, I received a rather hefty fine for that. Uh, again, data breaches, uh, data being lost or stolen. Um, so someone physically taking data off premise or physically taking a server off a train. Uh, and really another one is alteration to personal data without permission. So if you're going to do something to an individual's data and you don't have the permission to do it. So there's a real, there's a real mix of different uh, classifications around data breach. Uh, how long? And generally under GDPR, it's 72 hours. There are a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, they do get a little bit complicated, but um, the privacy and electronic communications regulations, which sort of apply to the likes of your telemarketing companies, uh, if their data is accessed or um, something happens to their data, they actually have a legal requirement to report that in, in less than 24 hours. Um, and also with the likes of um, the electronic identification trust services or your sort of electronic signature providers or your secure certificate providers, again, they, they have a legal requirement to report that sort of breach in less than 24 hours. Uh, NIS is generally around the 72 hour mark. Um, I would certainly be questioning if it was, when we're talking national infrastructure, uh, those events make it to the front pages of newspapers and social media in far less than 72 hours. So I think we'd be escalating that sort of implications up very quickly. Um, certainly it was a significant cyber event affecting mainline rail travel. Um, I can imagine that there would be significant government involvement very, very quickly. But so really the, the two key ones are 72 hours generally for both GDPR and NIS. Okay, um, and then coming back to NIS, you you mentioned that um, the com we need to be compliant by May. Um, do, is this the same for GDPR and NIS? Because obviously NIS consult consultation period um, has only just ended. So do you see a, a transition period for NIS so that maybe we've got slightly longer um, to actually get compliant for that one? Because GDPR has been talked about since as you say, 2016. Um, I absolutely see that there is a requirement for UK to pass that into law um, by May this year. Um, and I think they're targeting around about the 9th of May for NIS as their target. So I think they are playing catch up a little bit. Um, but again, that's a mandated requirement under the um, EU NIS directive. Um, that's been there for two years. It was released roughly around the same time as the GDPR one. So yes, while there is a lot more focus on GDPR, NIS has very, very similar timescales, and I can't see it slipping much past the middle of May. And like I say, the um, consultation document, I mean, I'm aware that consultation document was only released about the 28th of January this year, so it doesn't give us an awful lot of time. Um, but no, there is a real target around that May date. So there, there is um, quite an interest, uh, quite a lot of interest in NIS. So there, there's a, I think there's a conversation for us to pick up after, um, after this, this webinar, on that yeah. with um, a couple of a couple of the attendees. So I'm just conscious of time. So um, I've got two more questions. Um, for CCTV recording, would you need to design that all per persons are masked out? within the NVR, even if access is only for TOC and BTP? Oh, I think, again, it's part of that risk assessment. It's, all, it's okay saying it's only for TOC or BTP, but how do we guarantee that? Um, and I think, again, that will come down to that risk assessment analysis piece of it um, around the systems for it, because while we all think that we like to hold on to that data, uh, where is that data being stored? What would happen if that data in, in its transition period was on a train and someone stole the uh, video recorder off the train, or if it's in transmission. So I, I think you, you need to have a hard look at that and certainly document the, the assessment process you're going through uh, in order to certainly be compliant and protect the organization. And I'll come back to it again, it's that the documenting the actions that you take is very, very important to your organization because that's your defense in the event of a data breach. Okay. And um, so this, this is going to be the final question. So apologies if, if we have missed any any questions. We will certainly try and answer them afterwards on a on a one to one level. Um, so where if if one of someone on the call or on the webinar would like to find out more information 
in-depth information relating to GDPR. Um, are there any locations, websites that you can point them towards? Um, certainly the Information Commissioner's Office, which is ico.org, has some very, very good, fantastic information really around GDPR. Uh, simple, easy to understand. And give, given they are the, uh, the ones policing GDPR, um, they are a fantastic starting point. Um, other organisations like the uh, National Cyber Security Centre, uh, CISP, which is a Cyber Security Information Sharing Partnership, um, certainly if within the world of transportation, that's a great place to start because that's around cross-industry collaboration, um, CPNI as well. So there, there's four good sources. Uh, I think Rachel would obviously extend, um, if anyone wants to truly request something, we can provide them with a little bit more detail behind that. And just coming back to your comment around NIS, I think it's fantastic that people are asking the question because that's exactly what people need to be doing. Um, I say NIS isn't on the radar to the same degree that GDPR is, um, but it has some significant impacts on train, certainly on train operating companies, we believe. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, and with that, I'm afraid we, we are out of time. So thank you everyone for your questions and, and Mike for the presentation. Uh, we will be circulating the recording um, after this uh, session. Uh, please allow a couple of days for that to come through. Uh, and do feel free to contact us with um, any questions or continuing the conversation. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Mike. Bye.